So where do you get your data for business intelligence? Well, on this slide, you can see on the left-hand side, one source of internal business intelligence is from your transactional databases. So for example, if, you're, uh, if you have an e-commerce site that captures all of the sales that take place with your customers, you can pull all that data out for business intelligence. Although ideally you wouldn't do your, your, your deep level reporting on a running functional live transactional database. I, I believe I've shared in class some stories about how in businesses I've worked at when finance, financial analysts start running large queries against that type of uh, transactional database and suddenly the e-commerce site stops working because it slows down. So ideally you would export the data from a transactional database and put it into a data warehouse. Uh, and so uh, data warehouses can oftentimes be configured and optimized to analyze you know, tons and tons of data really quickly or allow you to look at it really quickly. Uh, you can also get your data outside of your organization, so gener generically in the cloud. Um, you could also look at dirt databases that were prepared by, for example, government entities. So oftentimes what you might do is take, like, for example, Bureau of Labor Statistics data or any other government compiled source of data and push that into your data warehouse where you then can analyze it using business intelligence tools. See if there's a relationship, for example, between income in certain areas and maybe the sales that you're seeing in, um, in your own data sets. And uh, another thing you could do is you could pull data from websites and from social networks. So one thing that's becoming common these days is to use uh, sentiment analysis software. So looking at large amounts of data that are created in the social media space. So imagine, for example, that you are Kentucky Fried Chicken or some chicken place and you create a new product and you want to know what people think about it. Well, you can pull in enormous quantities of just conversational data that's out there. So this is very unstructured. But the software is pretty good at it these days when, when it's doing sentiment analysis, trying to determine whether people like your stuff or don't like your stuff. And, and so you can use these tools to understand what, what's going on out there. Something that I demonstrated in class is a pivot table, and I did that on several sets of data. Uh, when we slice and dice data that way, we call it online analytical processing. And if we look over to the right side of this page, we see another conceptualization of, of using a pivot table to slice and dice data. So imagine in this, first off, we have this blue table containing dates where products were sold in a given location and how many were sold on that date. Um, on the right of that table, you see this multi-dimensional cube, as it's called. So you see that in the upper left of that cube, there's a little slice there. Uh, you might be interested in a business person in any of these slices. You might say, hey, in New York, for a given product, and then across the bottom, you see the time period. So in New York, for a given product, for a given time period, what were my sales? Uh, and you could think of this in terms of either quantity or in terms of sheer number sold, or could, you could think of it in terms of dollar volume sold. Uh, so these are the type of numbers that business people oftentimes care about. And you don't have to have just three dimensions. You can have four dimensions, five dimensions. And using the tools that are out there like pivot tables, it allows you to really quickly compare, you know, in a set of stores across different time periods uh, really quickly. And you can do this for many many different industries and so you know down there in the right hand corner you can see for example that you know if you were to use your time periods correctly it could almost instantaneously create a report that looks like what's in the lower right where across different quarters you can see in different stores what the quantities were some of the ways that you might apply business intelligence tools include uh, for example, what-if analysis, which can also be called a sensitivity analysis. Uh, oftentimes, so imagine, for example, you are presenting to a group of investors, trying to pitch your idea on a given business, and you say, hey, I expect that I'm going to be acquiring 10,000 new customers every year uh, for the next several years, and my monthly fee for my product will be $30 a month, and you might also have built in your spreadsheet your costs. Then it would be very logical for some angel investors or whoever else is analyzing your business plans to say, well, what would happen if you changed your 
customer acquisition level to half that, or you doubled your um, your income that you're getting, or, or things like that. And so just by quick changing numbers in a spreadsheet, that, that would be what-if analysis or sensitivity analysis. You, you change one number and, and watch how an entire spreadsheet changes. So you might have spreadsheets that are filled with uh, many different variables that create a whole bunch of forecasts economically or financially for your company, and you can play with those variables and, uh, and in real time watch what happens. And so that is a, a real useful way for some business people to make decisions. Uh, in class, we talked about goal seeking and optimization. Goal seeking being one of the tools that's available in Excel so that if you have a a problem where you want to you know, balance your income and expenses and, and find out what your break-even point is in terms of your number of customers or number of sales or if you want to hit a certain level of profitability you can also determine how many people you need. Uh, another thing I talked about in class is optimization so if you have various cost factors to consider like let's say for example you were staffing a hospital and you had people's, people with different salaries working at different times on different days with a number of different constraints and you have overtime to consider. If you wanted to optimize or reduce your expenses as a company, you can use you know, optimization features within Excel to tell you how you should lay out your schedule and who, who should get what hours on what day. Um, forecasting, um, you know, that's kind of a, a straightforward idea. Even just using charts, you can see what your trends are and, and try and guess where you're going to be in the future. A really advanced way of using business intelligence is to, rather than having a human being make the choice, it would be to have a computer make a choice re related to some decision that needs to be made. And so when we have a computer emulate something that a human being would decide on, we would call that artificial intelligence. And so one, one really great example of this is Amazon.com. We, you know, if, if you buy some items or rather throw some things in your basket, it's going to put up a little message saying that, hey, uh, people similar to you also bought these items, these following items, when they went to buy this item that you just put in your basket. Now, this is a very intelligent thing to do because for any any good retail store that, that has employees there, you know, like for example, if I, you know, they'll do the same thing. So, for, for example, when I bought a television, they would, they asked me, hey, do you need some mounting brackets? For your TV to hang it on the wall? Do you need these cables? And, and so upselling is not always just a bad thing. It, it can be just a very good and useful thing. You don't want to get home and find out you don't have the peripherals and other things that you need uh, to enjoy your products. Or maybe you're buying clothes at a store and they say, hey, would you like, you know, in, in addition to the, the you know, the, paint, the new suit you just bought, would you like to get some shoes or a belt that would match that? And, and these can be very useful things. And now, if you're talking about Amazon.com, where they have millions and millions and millions of products, uh, how would you do that with salespeople? Uh, it'd be pretty hard. But what you can do is you can use software to do the same thing, to be a recommendation agent as if it were a real person. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, if you've watched shows like Jeopardy, you've seen that they've been able to program at IBM computers that can act like a human being and beat real human beings in those games. So that's perhaps a, a little bit scary, but I, I don't think that computers at any time soon are, are going to be able to overtake us. Generally, i found that computers with artificial intelligence are really good in isolated instances to be trained for certain problems, but, but they can't really handle a broad set of problems. And in fact, it's oftentimes nice when they can handle really uh, repetitive tasks well because people tend to feel better when they offload those kind of tasks. Artificial intelligence can also be abused. So one thing that you may have noticed is that on a lot of websites you go to, there's a CAPTCHA. So as you go to fill out some form or register to use the site, uh, they make you type in some, some different letters there so that they can prove that you're a human being. Now, why do they do this? Well, you know, it, I think in recent years they estimated that you know, 25, 35 percent of the Twitter users are just computers, meaning that it, you can just write a piece of software that goes to a website and registers with a username and a password uh, as if it were a real person, and then it, it they they start sending out messages that way. And I, I, you know, throughout the years, I've seen a lot of people try to do this type of business where, you know, if you can 
create millions and millions of accounts uh, and then publish things like buy my book or would you like to work from home or, or just whatever it is if you can control millions and millions of accounts that are out there on the web yes it creates a lot of spam a lot of junk messaging but it's just way too tempting for people who have computer programmers available to avoid you know for them to not take advantage of the fact that they can just write a program that acts as if it's uh, a real person and uh, so you gotta Anyway, so it's a tricky balance. You want to keep fake stuff out and only let real people in. Speaking a little bit more on the applications of art artificial intelligence, uh, robots. I mean, it's kind of nice in factories that we can program uh, robots to do things that a human being would do. Oftentimes, these are very repetitive tasks that we probably wouldn't want to do anyway. Uh, and plus, if you're being paid to repair the robot or implement it, you probably get paid better. Uh, expert systems. I've, I've worked in the medical industry and you know what they would like to do is they would like to be able I mean wouldn't it be nice if you could go to a website and have it solve all the problems for you in terms of like for just in medicine uh, you're sick wouldn't it be nice to self-diagnose couldn't wouldn't it be possible to replace doctors knowledge and uh, think about it in terms of you know like you know that there's there's these games you can play like 20 questions you, you can buy devices at Toys R Us that allow you, you know, and most of the time, if you're thinking of something like a loaf of bread or a cup, like it, it can guess most of the animals and things like that in the world, it seems. Uh, so it is possible through yes, no type questions to be able to solve a lot of people's problems. Uh, nevertheless, I worked for several years with some, some people who were, uh, had spent the bulk of their career trying to create expert systems in the field of medicine, and, and they found it to be a, an enormously complex problem that even at, uh, at Harvard where this guy worked for, for most of his career they still didn't really have it nailed and and at the end of the day they it seemed like they kind of gave up on that kind of stuff. Neural nets are kind of an interesting idea. It's it's where you can take massive sets of data and try to try to actually learn so software that learns so uh, you know the financial industry and fraud is, is an area where they try to look for patterns and, and try and identify uh, what patterns are associated with, with 